Section 29 of the Theory of Moral Sentiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer W. The Theory of Moral Sentiments by Adam Smith. Part 6, Section 3 of Self-Command. In the humble project of private life, as well as in the ambitious and proud pursuit of high stations, great abilities and successful enterprise, in the beginning, have frequently encouraged undertakings which necessarily led to bankruptcy and ruin in the end. The esteem and admiration which every impartial spectator conceives for the real merit of those spirited, magnanimous, and high-minded persons, as it is a just and well-founded sentiment, so it is a steady and permanent one, and altogether independent of their good or bad fortune. It is otherwise with that admiration which he is apt to conceive for their excessive self-estimation and presumption. While they are successful, indeed, he is often perfectly conquered and overborne by them. Success covers from his eyes not only the great imprudence, but frequently the great injustice of their enterprises, and, far from blaming this defective part of their character, he often views it with the most enthusiastic admiration. When they are unfortunate, however, things change their colors and their names. What was before heroic magnanimity resumes its proper appellation of extravagant rashness and folly, and the blackness of that avidity and injustice which was before hid under the splendor of prosperity comes full into view, and blots the whole luster of their enterprise. Had Caesar, instead of gaining, lost the battle of Pharsalia, his character would, at this hour, have ranked a little above that of Catiline, and the weakest man would have viewed his enterprise against the laws of his country in blacker colors than perhaps even Cato, with all the animosity of a party man, ever viewed it at the time. His real merit, the justness of his taste, the simplicity and elegance of his writings, the propriety of his eloquence, his skill in war, his resources in distress, his cool and sedate judgment in danger, his faithful attachment to his friends, his unexampled generosity to his enemies, would all have been acknowledged, as the real merit of Catiline, who had many great qualities, is acknowledged at this day. But the insolence and injustice of his all-grasping ambition would have darkened and extinguished the glory from all that real merit. Fortune has in this, as well in some other respects already mentioned, great influence over the moral sentiments of mankind, and, according as she is either favorable or adverse, can render the same character the object either of general love and admiration, or of universal hatred and contempt. This great disorder in our moral sentiments is by no means, however, without its utility, and we may on this, as well as on many other occasions, admire the wisdom of God even in the weakness and folly of man. Our admiration of success is founded upon the same principle with our respect for wealth and greatness, and it is equally necessary for establishing the distinction of ranks and the order of society. By this admiration of success, we are taught to submit more easily to those superiors whom the course of human affairs may assign to us, to regard with reverence, and sometimes even with a sort of respectful affection, that fortunate violence which we are no longer capable of resisting, not only the violence of such splendid characters as those of a Caesar or Alexander, but often that of the most brutal and savage barbarians, of an Attila or a Genghis or a Tamerlane. To all such mighty conquerors, the great mob of mankind are naturally disposed to look up with a wondering, though no doubt with a very weak and foolish admiration. By this admiration, however, they are taught to acquiesce with less reluctance under that government which an irresistible force imposes upon them, and from which no reluctance could deliver them. Though in prosperity, however, the man of excessive self-estimation may sometimes appear to have some advantage over the man of correct and modest virtue, although the applause of the multitude, and of those who see them both only at a distance, is often much louder in favor of the one than it is ever in favor of the other. Yet, all things fairly computed, the real balance of advantage is, perhaps in all cases, 
greatly in favor of the latter and against the former. The man who neither ascribes to himself nor wishes that other people should ascribe to him any other merit besides that which really belongs to him fears no humiliation, dreads no detection, but rests contented and secure upon the genuine truth and solidity of his own character. His admirers may neither be very numerous nor very loud in their applauses, but the wisest man who sees him the nearest and knows him the best admires him the most. To a real wise man the judicious and well-weighted approbation of a single wise man gives more heartfelt satisfaction than all the noisy applauses of ten thousand ignorant, though enthusiastic, admirers. He may say with Parmenides, who, upon reading a philosophical discourse before a public display at Athens, and observing that, except Plato, the whole company had left him, continued, notwithstanding, to read on, and said that Plato alone was audience sufficient for him. It is otherwise with the man of excessive self-estimation. The wise men who see him the nearest admire him the least, amidst the intoxication of prosperity, their sober and just esteem falls so short of the extravagance of his own self-admiration that he regards it as merely malignity and envy. He suspects his best friends. Their company becomes offensive to him. He drives them from his presence, and often rewards their services not only with ingratitude, but with cruelty and injustice. He abandons his confidence to flatterers and traitors, who pretend to idolize his vanity and presumption, and that character which in the beginning, though in some respects defective, was upon the whole both amiable and respectable, becomes contemptible and odious in the end. Amidst the intoxication of prosperity, Alexander killed Clytus, for having preferred the exploits of his father Philip to his own, put Callisthenes to death in torture for having refused to adore him in the Persian manner, and murdered the great friend of his father, the venerable Parmenio, after having, upon the most groundless suspicions, sent first to the torture and afterwards to the scaffold the only remaining son of that old man the rest having all died before in his own service. This was that Parmenio of whom Philip used to say that the Athenians were very fortunate who could find ten generals every year, while he himself, in the whole course of his life, could never find but one Parmenio. It was upon the vigilance and attention of this Parmenio that he reposed at all times with confidence and security. In the hours of his mirth and jollity, he used to say, Let us drink, my friends. We may do it with safety, for Parmenio never drinks. It was the same Parmenio with whose presence and counsel it had been said Alexander had gained all of his victories, and without whose presence and counsel he had never gained a single victory. The humble, admiring, and flattering friends whom Alexander left in power and authority behind him divided his empire among themselves, and after having thus robbed his family and kindred of their inheritance, put, one after another, every single surviving individual of them, whether female or male, to death. We frequently not only pardon, but thoroughly enter into and sympathize with the excessive self-estimation of those splendid characters in which we observe a great and distinguished superiority above the common level of mankind. We call them spirited, magnanimous, and high-minded, words which all involve in their meaning a considerable degree of praise and admiration but we cannot enter into and sympathize with the excessive self-estimation of those characters in which we can discern no such distinguished superiority. We are disgusted and revolted by it, and it is with some difficulty that we can either pardon or suffer it. We call it pride or vanity, two words of which the latter always, and the former for the most part, involve in their meaning a considerable degree of blame. These two vices, however, though resembling in some respects as being both modifications of excessive self-estimation, are yet, in many respects, very different from one another. The proud man is sincere, and in the bottom of his heart is convinced of his own superiority, though it may sometimes be difficult to guess upon what that conviction is founded. He wishes you to view him in no light other than that in which, when he places himself in your situation, he really views himself. 
He demands no more of you than what he thinks justice. If you appear not to respect him as he respects himself, he is more offended than mortified, and feels the same indignant resentment as if he had suffered a real injury. He does not even then, however, deign to explain the grounds of his own pretensions. He disdains to court your esteem. He affects even to despise it, and endeavors to maintain his assumed station not so much by making you sensible of his superiority, as of your own meanness. He seems to wish not so much to excite your esteem for himself as to mortify that for yourself. The vain man is not sincere, and in the bottom of his heart is very seldom convinced of that superiority which he wishes you to ascribe him. He wishes you to view him in much more splendid colors than those in which, when he places himself in your situation and supposes you to know all that he knows, he can really view himself. When you appear to view him, therefore, in different colors, perhaps in his proper colors, he is much more mortified than offended. The grounds of his claim to that character which he wishes you to ascribe to him, he takes every opportunity of displaying, both by the most ostentatious and unnecessary exhibition of good qualities and accomplishments, which he possesses in some tolerable degree, and sometimes even by false pretensions to those which he either possesses in no degree, or in so very slender a degree that he may well enough be said to possess them in no degree. Far from despising your esteem, he courts it with most anxious assiduity. Far from wishing to mortify your self-estimation, he is happy to cherish it, in hopes that in return you will cherish his own. He flatters in order to be flattered. He studies to please, and endeavors to bribe you into a good opinion of him by politeness and complacence, and sometimes even by real and essential good offices, though often displayed, perhaps, with unnecessary ostentation. The vain man sees the respect which is paid to rank and fortune, and wishes to usurp this respect, as well as that for talents and virtues. His dress, his equipage, his way of living, accordingly, all announce both a higher rank and greater fortune than really belong to him. And in order to support this foolish imposition for a few years in the beginning of his life, he often reduces himself to poverty and distress long before the end of it. As long as he can continue his expense, however, his vanity is delighted with viewing himself, not in the light in which you would view him if you knew all that he knows, but that in which he imagines he has, by his own address, induced you actually to view him. Of all the illusions of vanity, this is perhaps the most common. Obscure strangers who visit foreign countries, or who from a remote province come to visit, for a short time, the capital of their own country, most frequently attempt to practice it. The folly of the attempt, though always very great and most unworthy of a man of sense, may not be altogether so great upon such as upon most other occasions. If their stay is short, they may escape any disgraceful detection, and after indulging their vanity for a few months or a few years, they may return to their own homes and repair, by future parsimony, the waste of their past profusion. The proud man can very seldom be accused of this folly. His sense of his own dignity renders him careful to preserve his independency, and, when his fortune happens not to be large, though he wishes it to be decent, he studies to be frugal and attentive in all his expenses. The ostentatious expense of the vain man is highly offensive to him. It outshines, perhaps, his own. It provokes his indignation as an insolent assumption of a rank which is by no means due, and he never talks of it without loading it with the harshest and severest reproaches. The proud man does not always feel himself at his ease in the company of his equals, and still less in that of his superiors. He cannot lay down his lofty pretensions, and the countenance and conversation of such company overawe him so much that he dare not display them. He has recourse to humbler company, for which he has little respect, which he would not willingly choose, and which is by no means agreeable to him, that of his inferiors, his flatterers, and dependents. 
He seldom visits his superiors, or, if he does, it's rather to show that he's entitled to live in such company than for any real satisfaction that he enjoys in it. It is, as Lord Clarendon says of the Earl of Arundel, that he sometimes went to court because he could there only find a greater man than himself, but that he went very seldom because he found there a greater man than himself. It is quite otherwise with the vain man. He courts the company of his superiors as much as the proud man shuns it. Their splendor, he seems to think, reflects a splendor upon those who are much about them. He haunts the courts of kings and the levies of ministers. He gives himself the air of being a candidate for fortune and preferment, when in reality he possesses the much more precious happiness, if he knew how to enjoy it, of not being one. He is fond of being admitted to the tables of the great, and still more fond of magnifying to other people the familiarity with which he is honored there. He associates himself as much as he can with fashionable people, those who are supposed to direct the public opinion, with the witty, with the learned, with the popular, and he shuns the company of his best friends whenever the very uncertain current of public favor happens to run in any respect against them. With the people to whom he wishes to recommend himself, he is not always very delicate about the means which he employs for that purpose. Unnecessary ostentation, groundless pretensions, constant assentation, frequently flattery, though for the most part a pleasant and sprightly flattery, and very seldom the gross and fulsome flattery of a parasite. The proud man, on the contrary, never flatters, and is frequently scarce civil to anybody. Notwithstanding all its groundless pretensions, however, vanity is almost always a sprightly and a gay, and often very good-natured passion. Pride is always a grave, a sullen, and a severe one. Even the falsehoods of the vain man are all innocent falsehoods, meant to raise himself, not to lower other people. To do the proud man justice, he very seldom stoops to the baseness of falsehood. When he does, however, his falsehoods are by no means so innocent. They are all mischievous, and meant to lower other people. He is full of indignation and the unjust superiority, as he thinks it, which is given them. He views them with malignity and envy, and, in talking of them, often endeavors, as much as he can, to extenuate and lessen whatever are the grounds upon which their superiority is supposed to be founded. Whatever tales are circulated to their disadvantage, though he seldom forges them himself, yet he often takes pleasure in believing them, is by no means unwilling to repeat them, and even sometimes with a degree of exaggeration. The worst falsehoods of vanity are all what we call white lies. Those of pride, whenever it condescends to falsehood, are all of the opposite complexion. Our dislike to pride and vanity generally disposes us to rank the persons whom we accuse of those vices rather below than above the common level. In this judgment, however, I think we are most frequently in the wrong, and that both the proud and the vain man are often, perhaps for the most part, a good deal above it, though not near so much as either the one really thinks himself or as the other wishes you to think him. If we compare them with their own pretensions, they may appear the just objects of contempt. But when we compare them with what the greater part of their rivals and competitors really are, and they may appear quite otherwise and very much above the common level. Where there is real superiority, pride is frequently attended with many respectable virtues, with truth, with integrity, with a high sense of honor, with cordial and steady friendship, with one of the most inflexible firmness and resolution. Vanity, with many amiable ones, with humanity, with politeness, with a desire to oblige in all little matters, and sometimes with a real generosity in great ones. A generosity, however, which it often wishes to display in the most splendid colors it can. By their rivals and enemies, the French, in the last century, were accused of vanity the Spaniards of pride, and foreign nations were disposed to consider the one as the more amiable, the other as the more respectable people. The words vain and vanity are never taken in a good sense. 
We sometimes say of a man, when we are talking of him in good humor, that he is the better for his vanity, or that his vanity is more diverting than offensive. But we still consider it as a foible, and as a ridicule in his character. The words proud and pride, on the contrary, are sometimes taken in a good sense. We frequently say of a man that he's too proud, or that he has too much noble pride ever to suffer himself to do a mean thing. Pride is, in this case, confounded with magnanimity. Aristotle, a philosopher who certainly knew the world, in drawing the character of the magnanimous man, paints him with many features which, in the last two centuries, were commonly ascribed to the Spanish character that he was deliberate in all his resolutions, slow and even tardy in all his actions, that his voice was grave, his speech deliberate, his step and motion slow, that he appeared indolent and even slothful, not at all disposed to bustle about little matters, but to act with the most determined and vigorous resolution upon all great and illustrious occasions that he was not a lover of danger, or forward to expose himself to little dangers, but to great dangers, and that when he exposed himself to danger, he was altogether regardless of his life. The proud man is commonly too well contented with himself to think that his character requires any amendment. The man who feels himself all perfect naturally enough despises all further improvement. His self-sufficiency and absurd conceit of his own superiority commonly attend him from his youth to his most advanced age, and he dies, as Hamlet says, with all his sins upon his head, unanointed, unannealed. It is frequently otherwise with the vain man. The desire of the esteem and admiration of other people, when for qualities and talents which are the natural and proper objects of esteem and admiration, is the real love of true glory, a passion which, if not the very best passion of human nature, is certainly one of the best. Vanity is very frequently no more than an attempt to prematurely usurp that glory before it is due. Though your son, under five-and-twenty years of age, should be but a coxcomb, do not, upon that account, despair of his becoming, before he is forty, a very wise and worthy man, and a real proficient in all those talents and virtues to which, at present, he may only be an ostentatious and empty pretender. The great secret of education is to direct vanity to proper objects. Never suffer him to value himself upon trivial accomplishments, but do not always discourage his pretensions to those that are of real importance. He would not pretend to them if he did not earnestly desire to possess them. Encourage this desire. Afford him every means to facilitate the acquisition, and do not take too much offense, although he should sometimes assume the air of having attained it a little before the time. Such, I say, are the distinguishing characteristics of pride and vanity, when each of them acts according to its proper character. But the proud man is often vain, and the vain man is often proud. Nothing can be more natural than that man, who thinks much more highly of himself than he deserves, should wish that other people should think still more highly of him, or that the man, who wishes that other people should think more highly of him than he thinks of himself, should, at the same time, think much more highly of himself than he deserves. These two vices being frequently in the same character, the characteristics of both are necessarily confounded, and we sometimes find the superficial and impertinent ostentation of vanity joined to the most malignant and derisive insolence of pride. We are sometimes, upon that account, at a loss how to rank a particular character, or whether to place it among the proud or among the vain. End of section 29